um, we're glad you're at the uh, our, uh, cotton production workshop, and this is the insect pest management uh, section. Uh, I'm Philip Roberts, extension entomologist, uh, located here on the Tifton campus uh, with the University of Georgia. Um, I'm going to talk for about the first half of our, our time, and then our research entomologist, Dr. Mike Taves, is going to visit with us a little bit. But just to get started, uh, I want, uh, and I, I know I see at least one face that's, that's been to one of my county meetings, but uh, look at those cotton squares, and, and I want somebody to tell me what's wrong with them. That's very good. That's a bow weevil. That's bow weevil damage. Bow weevils, of course, they can feed on a square where they just chew a hole into it, but they also will lay an egg inside that fruiting structure and seal it up. And the bow weevil actually completes its whole life cycle inside a piece of cotton fruit, whether primarily squares, but it could be cotton bowls. Um, but they're always uh, within that fruiting structure. So back when we were treating bow weevils, we had to spray them how often? every three or four days. And we'd have to spray for about a, about a three week window just to break that cycle. So a lot of insecticide sprays uh, had to go out for bow weevils. Now you've seen this slide before, but what this slide is depicting is the average number of insecticide sprays applied to Georgia cotton starting back in 1986. Uh, going up to the current current, uh, current time, but back in 1986, represented by the red bar here, cotton was sprayed on average almost 16 times. And I started with 1986 because that's the year prior to the bow weevil eradication program beginning. Now, the green bars, that's the era where we've had BT cotton and we've also been bow weevil free. And on average, we're spraying cotton two to three times in the state of Georgia, on average. What a difference of where we were and where we've come from. Now, when I shared information, hey, we sprayed cotton 16 times back then, some folks really would question whether we did that. And I tell them, I says, you know, there were folks who sprayed individual fields 20 times, maybe 25 times. And you, you, some of you folks can remember it. Just out of curiosity, and I wish you'd do this for me, if you've ever seen a bow weevil, please raise, raise your hand. Okay, pretty good, probably about 30, 40%. You know, when we do this across the state of Georgia and I ask folks to do this, it's about 20% of the folks have ever seen a bow weevil. Last bow weevil reproduction that occurred in the state of Georgia was 2002. So we really hadn't had a bow weevil in the state uh, since 2002. But I was uh, in my office the other day looking for something and I ran across the old Georgia Cotton Research and Extension Report, Dr. Crawford, from 1983. I bet you had something in there. But my predecessor, Bill Lambert, had a, a trial in there where he was comparing pyrethroid insecticides. And we still use pyrethroids today, but um, I guess the first time we began using pyrethroids was 79, but a lot of new pyrethroids were coming out. And he did this on a grower field here in Tith County. And when he compared those pyrethroids, he sprayed them seven times over about a 35-day period. Okay? That, you know, each, each product was sprayed that much. Interestingly, though, prior to him initiating the trial, the grower had already sprayed the field three times during June. When he was spraying these pyrethroids, it wasn't quite a tight enough interval. He, the grower dropped in and oversprayed bow weevils one time. He also had to put a spray out for spider mites during this window. And at the end of the year, the grower sprayed four more times. So that's how you spray cotton 16 times. You know, we don't ever want to be there or go back there. Elimination of the bow weevil has meant a lot to the state of Georgia and the cotton industry in the state of Georgia and, and across the southeast and U.S. I know you can't see this map very well, but this is a, a map that actually shows the distribution of the boll weevil from when, when it was first introduced back in 1892. Boll weevil is not native to the U.S. It, it, it migrated in. It's an exotic pest, but it entered the U.S. down in South Texas in 1892. It made it to Georgia in about 1915. 
you know, and uh, so back then. But eradication has been a real success. Basically, all of the U.S. is weevil free except this area in South Texas where they're still in active eradication or still still have boll weevils. Yes, question. So, since the boll weevil has been in the tip end of Texas for 120 years, what have, what have those folks done to grow cotton pest management wise? I mean, what are they, is it, they were still able to grow cotton, correct? Still able to grow cotton. We can still grow cotton, but in Georgia, we wouldn't grow it as profitably. We wouldn't be planting 1.3 million acres of cotton if we had boll weevils. Um, but no, you can still grow cotton. Um, but uh, it would not be as easy and it would not be as profitable. But, but they've still grown cotton, but they hadn't seen, you know, we went from, you know, a lot of things caused our cotton industry to really explode. It be cotton became uh, a better economic option. But pest management and boll weevil eradication had a lot to do with that. Our acres really shot up following eradication because it helped profitability of the crop uh, here in Georgia. But elimination of the boll weevil, uh, that was an important thing. It really has allowed you as growers to do a good job with integrated pest management. Um, you as growers to be able to make good decisions um, in terms of managing insects. Hopefully at our discussion today, we're going to help you learn more about insects, gain more knowledge. You know, the more you know about anything, the better decisions you'll make. So, so hopefully we'll do that today. Scouts and consultants, and I've said this before, the best money you can spend is hire, hiring a good scout or a consultant. Someone who can get you the information of what you got in the field, you know, what pest, populations, help you time sprays, whether or not you need to spray, but that's the best money you can spend in terms of insect pest management. Here's a picture of Dr. Taves. He's our research entomologist, and he's been with us since 2007, and he's dropping his, or he, he'll be here shortly, but uh, um, I don't know if it's his three daughters or the fact that he's been a cotton entomologist. His hair is not quite as dark as it is there. But. I want to make a few comments about thrips. Thrips are our most consistent pest we have in cotton. Um, this is just a picture of, of some of trials we had across the road. You know, we're constantly comparing, you know, it could be different insecticides, it could be planting dates, a lot of different things in our research plots. But these are two row plots and I think it's very easy to see the ones that were untreated because you can't see much growth there. You're familiar with the stunning you always see. I think I've showed this slide to you before, but you know, something that's always intrigued me is the stunning you see above ground, you know, due to thrips entry, the same stunning occurs below ground. And we actually set up a trial, me and Dr. Taves a couple years ago, where we manipulated cotton to basically have low thrips damage, moderate thrips damage, and what I would call severe thrips damage. And these bars on the right is actually the weight of the above ground part of the plant. On the left is the weight of the roots or below ground part of the plant. So that's always been interesting to me, you know, that where we have stunning above ground, we have that same stunning below ground, and uh, sometimes I think that's overlooked. But thrips can be important. It's not something we should take for granted because we're going to have a problem with them. And the one thing to take home message I want you to have today is if you have slow seedling growth, and that could be from cool temperatures, it could be from some other plant stress, maybe even herbicide entry. But if that cotton seedling is not growing, that's when thrips can really hurt you in terms of reducing yield potential. Some of the best medicine we have for thrips is a rapidly growing seedling. And that's good for a lot of things. Now we have a threshold for thrips, two to three immature thrips per plant. Um, you know, I wish we scouted cotton a lot more intensely than we do, especially early season. But in reality, a lot of us are just looking at these true leaves and looking at for damage. And if you're doing that, I want to really stress that you look close. You pull plants up and you look down at that bud. This little plant on the left, these were planted the same date, but I can tell you that cotton is hammered and it is hurt bad. 
as that leaf is already gnarled up. But if you didn't look close, you wouldn't notice it until that leaf tried to open up more and you'd be four or five days late um, with a spray. But with thrips, our goal is to get to the fourth leaf. Once we put that fourth, fourth true leaf on the plant and the plant is growing, you know, we're pretty much uh, off to the races. <coughs> now basically, most of our acres are going to be treated uh, with an at plant insecticide. And the reason why is simple. We can show it in plot data and, and on farm trials, whatever you want. You've seen it on your farm. But if you're putting something down at planting for thrips, we see a very consistent yield response. Extremely consistent, and you know that. And we've got uh, several options. Um, we can put infar sprays out, and then we've got some seed treatments. But most of our cotton is going to be treated with what I want to call a neonic seed treatment. Now we have two active ingredients, one is imidacloprid, the other is thiamethoxam. They're both neonicotinoid insecticides and they're both available as a seed treatment. Imidacloprid is the insecticide in gaucho, it's also the insecticide in Eris, as well as a couple of the accelerons. Thiamethoxam is the insecticide in Cruiser and Evicta, all right? Now they perform very similar. So when I talk about these two active ingredients, I just want to refer to them as a neonic seed treatment because they, they provide very similar performance. Now you can purchase these seed treatments already on the seed. Seed company may treat the seed for you or some of your dealers will have downstream treaters and kind of over, over treat, treat the seed. Now these products are very consistent in what they do on the farm. Um, we have a really good understanding and a good feel for what to expect with these products. They're active on thrips for about three weeks after planting. 21 days they're going to show activity on thrips and offer some control of thrips. After 21 days we've pretty much lost that residual activity. Now in some situations we may need longer residual than 21 days. In other situations we may be fine but they're very consistent in what they do. The other thing I really want to stress, the first 14 days of that plant's life is probably the most critical in terms of thrips control. We can't have one leaf cotton get dinged up from thrips or we're going to suffer some yield loss, okay? So you've got to have good control very early in development and again, if that plant's not growing rapidly. That's a key thing. But when we use these seed treatments, you know, I told you they were consistent in what they do, but we may need a foliar insecticide to supplement control, all right, if infestations are high, for example. Now, I've tried to summarize data from several years, and when you think about thrips, I want you to think a little bit about risk. And you think about your farm where you've had to spray thrips in years past. Um, there's a couple commonalities I think you could, you, if you thought about it, you'd pull out. Number one, if we're going to have issues with thrips, typically it's on our early planted cotton. And we can, I could show you data if we needed to. We, we know we have higher populations on April planted cotton than we do on cotton planted in late May. It's just one of those things. We also know that there are fewer thrips in a reduced tillage system. Now we've moved a lot back to conventional tillage in some areas. And if you've made that move, you know, you're going to have, expect a little more thrips pressure. And that's fine. We just need to know what to expect. But I like to think about these, just those two factors in terms of risk. And you can actually come up with what I would call a low risk environment for thrips and a high risk environment for thrips. And what I've done is I'm comparing yields in these two environments. In a, in a low risk environment for thrips, that's cotton planted after May 10th, or if we had cotton planted in a uh, reduced tillage situation. We don't expect to have a lot of thrips. High risk environment, cotton planted before May 10th, conventional tillage. We expect to have a lot of thrips and we did. What I want you to look at is these red bars compared to the green bar. The blue bar is untreated seed, which we're not gonna do. The red bar is a neonic seed treatment alone. Okay, 
Low risk environment, we still need to use, use it. We get a very nice yield response there. High risk environment, you know, when we use the seed treatment, we get a nice yield response there. But what I really want you to focus on is the comparison I'm making between the seed treatment alone and the seed treatment with a foliar spray at the first true leaf. When we didn't expect to have many thrips, we're in this low risk environment, basically no difference in yield. I mean, numerically very similar, statistically no difference. But when we're in this high risk environment for thrips, highly statistically significant, you know, and we see that's only about an 80 pound difference in yield, but it's very consistent, that response to putting a foliar spray on top of the seed treatment in this high risk environment, it's a very consistent yield response. Now, at the bottom of this slide, and if you get one of our scout handbooks, we actually write about this a little more. But unless you have a good scout and he's doing a good job, you know, and you're confident that thrips populations are below threshold, um, we believe it's worth considering just, or worth go ahead and put this foliar spray on one leaf cotton if you're in that environment where we expect to have a lot of thrips pressure. Okay, so you can read more about that in the handbook. Now, since we've lost Aldecarb or Timic, um, entomologists across the southeast have started working on a regional project. If you remember several years ago, I talked to you about a regional stink bug project. Uh, this is funded by Cotton Incorporated and uh, Cotton Commissions across the southeast. But we started working on thrips, and, and I tell you, when we work together, we get a lot more locations. We learn a lot more, a lot quicker. But what I'm depicting here is just, uh, we stuck in an insecticide efficacy trial, and here's various products here at the bottom. Um, you can see Asaphate here, still one of our very good performers, and this is the number of immature thrips. Um, one thing I will point out, we got a pyrethroid here. You know, guys, we don't need to use a pyrethroid, pyrethroid for thrips control. All right, we need to use something systemic so that it'll get down into the, the plant itself. But, but we have options for controlling thrips. But some other things we're looking at is this foliar spray timing. And I'm going to show you a slide on that in a minute. And also, we're actually looking at starter fertilizer, or we've looked at starter fertilizer. Why do we do that? Again, we're trying to get that rapidly growing seedling to tolerate thrips better. So we're trying to put the whole big puzzle together. Here's a little data from Dr. Taves. This, I believe, is 2012 data. Um, just to set this up a bit, we'll just look at this bar on the left. The three bars on the left, three sets of bars on the left are where a starter was used. The three bars on the right are no starter. The dark bars are a neonic seed treatment. The gray bars are no insecticide on the seed where you see a zero, one, or two, a zero would be no foliar spray, one would be a foliar spray at the first leaf, two would be a foliar spray at the second leaf. And the interesting thing is, if you just focus on these black bars, this is actually plant biomass. We're looking at the actual size of the seedlings at about uh, six weeks after planting. If you just look at these sets of three bars, that first leaf spray is always better than the second. It's a very consistent response. So a lot of times I get a question, well, are we spraying too quick on thrips at that first leaf? We don't think so. Um, it always is, a, you look over here, this was in Tifton, this is in Plains. But that second leaf, I mean the first leaf spray is always better than the two with the second leaf. Not much there, but it's a very consistent response and it's not just this past year. And it's not just in Georgia, it's across the southeast. But if we're going to do something for thrips, we need to treat them early. You know, we used to spray a lot of cotton at the fourth and fifth leaf. A lot of thrips were sprayed at the fourth and fifth leaf. Folks, we were too late. We were way too late. Dr. Taze is going to talk to you a lot more about stink bugs. You know, this comes back to having a good scout. We've got good thresholds. Let's use them. Stink bugs are by far the most common insect we're going to spray. A message I continue to try to get people to think about is understand what else is in the field. Um, 
Could be spider mites, could be white flies, could be a lot of small worms in blooms. But the presence of those insects should influence decisions when, when you're targeting stink bugs um, or whatever pest you're spraying. Um, let's make good decisions. Let's try not to do anything that will aggravate these pests or maybe there's some things we could do where we might get a little bit of suppression on those pests. So think of the big picture. Think of the big picture. Every, most of the acres we plant are BT cottons. They're great technologies, but I still want to emphasize to you they're not immune from insect damage. Okay? They're not immune. Spider mites, I've been working with spider mites for about five years now. Um, spider mites are present in about every field I go in uh, in Georgia. I can find spider mites. Not at economic levels, not at levels you would treat, but they're there. They're present. One day, I keep thinking something's going to happen and we're going to go over the edge and we're going to blow them up, but it just hadn't happened. Um, but they're there. And one thing I can tell you for sure, I can make it go over the edge. I've done it for about five years in a row. I see Bob back there in the back. He's seen them. Um, this is just showing uh, some results of a mite efficacy trial, showing number of mites per square inch, but we got some real good products for controlling mites. Um, can they impact yield? Yes. Um, here's some yield data um, from 2011, and here's the untreated way down here at the bottom. So yes, they can impact yield. This is some mites that got in some pre bloom cotton and stayed there for about a month. Had a big impact. Not much of an impact, but still a tendency for treatments on the right to, to have higher yield. 2009, similar trend. So it can be a, a problem for us. What we want to do though as growers and managers of these, these insects is avoid blowing them up or avoid having to treat for them at all. And I still think growers in Georgia can take a lot of credit for not going over this edge and blowing up mites. They may not realize they're doing it, but decisions they're making are helping us with this pest. I want to finish up with just a couple comments on silverleaf whitefly. Um, if you grew cotton in Tiff County or Colquitt County, you know silverleaf whitefly. Um, it appears it's about a one out of five year pest. And I see some folks down from the southwest corner, y'all have had silverleaf whitefly, but silverleaf whitefly are similar to aphids. They suck on uh, the plant and reduce, um, uh, just kind of put stress on the plant. Uh, in severe situations, we can see premature defoliation, and when we see that, that's when yield is really hurt. We can also have accumulation of honeydew and sooty mold uh, on leaves as well as open cotton. One thing to remember, and if you live in this area, you know it, but if you don't, it's something you can put in the back of your mind. This is a picture of a variety trial several years ago. You see that line, smooth leaf cotton on the left, hairy leaf cotton on the right. White flies really like hairy leaf cottons, okay? No question. If you're in Tift or Colquitt counties, you need to really think hard about planting a hairy cotton, especially planting it late. Now, if you're planting in April or early May, we're probably fine, but if you're planting in late May or June, probably want to avoid hairy leaf cottons, or at least know that white flies are potentially going to be more of an issue for you. We've got tools to help these growth regulators, but again, what we want to do as growers is avoid having to treat this problem. So if you see a few white flies, it needs to influence decisions you make, and let's try not to blow them up. With that, uh, just want to say uh, we do have two scout schools scheduled. Um, we would love for you to come, come to one of those, um, but uh, June 10th here in Tifton, and we also do one in Midville. And that'll be on June 18th. Any questions? Right. Well, so what, what are we going to do? 
Well, um, I still believe we are getting some control. And uh, number one, and coming off a year like we had this year, you're going to have, once we were in white flies, we had white flies to the end. I don't care what you did, right? And if I said it once, I said it 20 times, don't look at the flies, look at the foliage. And if you've maintained green foliage and filled out that crop, I think we were successful. Um, still, uh, these growth regulators such as NAC are still our best option and basically only option we have, but we're not going to rid the field of white flies. We got to have the mindset that, that we're going to preserve yield and we're going to keep the foliage healthy and green and avoid any honeydew. But uh, we, we got a problem there. Oh, oh, absolutely. Well, yeah, I, you know, I don't know yet. And, and, and I just, I, I never had opportunity to visit what I thought was a true failure this past year. But it was a tough year, there ain't no doubt. But there were so many white flies in the system. Any other questions? Increase of plant bugs. Plant bugs are such a, uh, are we having an increase in them? I don't know that I could say that. Um, it's still a very sporadic pest for us. Um, we have fields every year that need to be treated. Some of those are treated. Some of them we don't know they need to be treated because we ain't checking them like we need to. But I don't know that we can say it's more of an issue than, you know, we may spray five to 10% of the acres in Georgia for plant bugs. But I, I don't think it's getting worse, personally. But again, it could in, 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 in some local areas. Any other questions? Okay. Um, well, we're glad y'all are here today. Uh, You're the world's slowest engineer. Any other questions while we're waiting on Dr. Taves to, to load his presentation? <laughs> Well, if you, if you want to be proactive for white flies, what are some things we could do? Number one is planting date. I'm not going to tell you to plant early, but I'm going to say let's try to avoid late plantings. You know, um, where we're hurt by white flies the most is absolutely on our late planted cotton. So that's one thing we could do. Um, but again, I don't know that you plant early. You just try not to get caught where you have to plant in June, for example, or maybe even late May. What's something else you could do? Well, you think about variety selection, particularly on the latter part of your planting window. Uh, perhaps you could avoid some of these hairy leaf cottons. So that's the second thing you could do. Is there any difference between a seed's mood and a seed's You know, we hadn't quantified that, but if you just ask my opinion, I think there is. I, I think it's a pretty direct correlate correlation. The hairier the cotton, um, the more white flies we see. But uh, so I, I really think there is. Um, third thing you could do um, is just scout, 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 scout. So that's something you could do. And once you know they're there, um, you know, let's make sure we're using thresholds for other pests and try not to treat unless you absolutely have to. Fourth thing you could do, and this would be great, but this is not always under your control as a cotton farmer, but uh, when these vegetable crops are done, something like melons or cantaloupe, something like that, when that last harvest is done, destroy that crop, you know, you know, because uh, that's a great source of white flies that are coming to cotton. Um, you know, maybe your vegetable guy's going to be willing to help us out because what's going to happen when you defoliate your cotton? They're going back to him. We, we, we're passing them back and forth, see. So there's a couple things you could do there. Um, and there may be some more if we thought about it, but... But it's a pest, it's an agricultural pest for all of us, not just uh, cotton. But it take a lot of cooperation there. Any other questions? Well, the latest update on the Mimic. On the Mimic, I don't have um, uh, any direct information from the company. There's a company out of North Carolina called MEY. They do have the registration for the product. Um, now this is hearsay, um, but I think we would have heard something different 
uh, if it were going to be available, but it's my understanding it will not be available for this year. Um, they're still hoping to bring the product to the marketplace. Um, and again, that's hearsay. Uh, I've heard that they found a source for the active ingredient. They still need a place to formulate it, but, but that I, I don't know. That's just rumors I've heard from colleagues. But uh, I don't think it will, you know, I think if we don't know that it's going to be here for this use season, it's not going to be here. Back to the uh, bovine eradication thing, do you know if the extension of the farm bill brought some, some funds to keep beating it back over in the uh, Rio Grande Valley or not? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it's possible the funds that have been helping the front of the program, that those uh, uh, may not be available. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting when you, you know, when the, in the heyday of cotton in Georgia, what's the most cotton ever planted in Georgia? Anybody got a guess? 1918. 1918, you know how many? Five million. Very good. Then what happened? How long did it take to drop in half? Very quick. <laughs> and actually from that five million acres back in 1918, it was on a steady decline to was it the early 80s we got down around 100,000 acres of cotton in Georgia? I mean, the bow weevil was killing cotton. It worked on it for 75 years, and then we worked on him, right? And it's amazing that it happened. Okay, Dr. Taves. Well, you got, a, you got your, your title up, so you're good to go. <laughs> One more question, John. Shouldn't be a problem. They should lay there fine. Shouldn't be a problem. Um, shouldn't lose anything there. Question was how long would they lay in dry dirt? Should be fine laying dry dirt, then once you get a rain to get it up, you should take it up when you germinate. The other slide you had up there, you had starter. How much starter did you use? We used 10 gallons of 10340. Uh, and again, we were just, we're just looking. We know we don't have Timic. And we're just, we know a vigorous plant endures thrips better, so we're just trying to piece a lot of little things together. And we're not recommending starter, but we're just thinking. We're thinking, and we want you to think. Are you ready? There we go.